The last good king, Ezekiel, there's a reformation under Ezekiel, there's a big great king and the, 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 the prosperity in the land. Then after that, you see Isaiah has been speaking for 60 years, this message, and we believe that he has been sown and two under the evil king. Manasseh, his son Ammon, are the most wicked king of all the kings put together. They are horrible what they have led the kingdom of of God to, to away from God. And then, as you see Jeremiah, and in chapter 1 of Jeremiah, we'll find how he came, what the time that he started. He started during Josh, Joshua's uh, reign. Joshua became king as a child. And uh, he became a good king. And he brought a reformation, the people back to God. So when Jeremiah started his ministry, he actually started in a good time and in a way because the people seen that they were returning to God. But he died very young. His rules were short and his reformation was superficial. So people, did, it didn't change really their heart. I mean, he changed the rule, maybe some government rules, but the heart of the people did not change. So Jeremiah... Uh, prophesied until the deportation uh, to, during the, the, the duration of five last kings of Judah, starting with Joshua, Jehoiakim, Jehoiakim, and Zedekiah. And he spoke for 40 years. He was persecuted, was put in prison, he was laughed at. And even though he spoke for years and years, he never succeeded to bring back. So his mission was some kind of a failure. He didn't fail because he was obedient to God. In God's eyes, he didn't. But the mission to bring God's people back, it didn't. So then God had to judge them. So that is the background. So if we want to look at a key passage in Jeremiah to set forth his message, the message of the book, we will turn to the slide, Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13. And this is God speaking through Jeremiah. For my people have done two evil things. They have abandoned me, the fountain of living water, and they have dug for themselves cracked cisterns that can hold no water at all. God is like a spring of living water, a fountain of water. There's abundant supply of water. It's fresh, it's pure, and it is good. There's a constant source of blessing. A cistern has no water supply of its own. You have to fill the cisterns. But a broken cistern, it's quite worse because even though you put uh, storage of water, it's going, it's going to, to leak. I remember years ago, my wife and I, we were in Beijing for a few weeks uh, some uh, diplomat from Canada had let us uh, use their flat it was very luxurious it was like a four four floors nice big big apartment and we spent a few weeks there and they had a water bed and that was our first time to try a water bed that's cool you can you know like go and uh, <laughs> wave yourself at night and all this and Sometimes I would try, to, if my wife was going to bed first, and I would come in the bed and tell, boom! <laughs> and then she would like float like that. So we had so much fun. And then, uh, so one time she wanted to get me, so she did it. And during that night, we woke up, we were all wet. <laughs> We didn't know and we panicked because we broke the bed and we are the guests and they are in Canada and we were there by ourselves and then we were panicking, we were looking in the drawers everywhere, then we found some glue and a patch and we found that this bed had been damaged before and they put a patch and when my wife jumped, then it broke, it broke it and we got, so we, we, we fixed it. So a water bed that has a crack in it is not really good. It's like a water cistern that uh, has, has crack in it. It's cannot, it cannot be used for, for the good purpose. So that is how the people of Judah had become. God has been a blessing. He wanted to bless them more, had good plans for them. But they turned and they became, that they put their trust in the idols of the foreign nations, that foreign idols. They even burned their children to some of these idols. They put their blessings and their past glory, King David, like the, the military and stuff like that, and the, the prosperity that they had. They also put their trust into uh, the, alliances, the alliances that they made with other military powers, like Egypt and Assyria, so that they could be protected and all of this. So all of these 
at the source of their trust had become like broken cisterns. It was empty, it couldn't, idols cannot bless you. Uh, the alliances of, with the other world powers could not save them unless God would uh, be, be with them. So all of the, the things that they trusted in were empty, just like broken systems. If we go to the next text, you will see even something more revealing. God many times with the prophets always go back to the beginning and it is good for us as well. Look back when you found Jesus and now you look at yourself and he says, hmm, something is not like it should be. It used to be wonderful. It used to be, I was so zealous. I was so uh, worshipful. I, I was reading the Bible so much. I was so much interested and it's not there. So God many times used the prophets and remind them of the first connection that God started to build his people through Abraham, uh, Isaac, and Jacob. So he says, when I led your ancestors out of Egypt, I was n it was not burnt offering and sacrifices I wanted for them. This is what I told them. And he's telling us the same. Obey me, and I will be your God, and you will be my people. Do everything as I say, and all will be well. How many of you want all will be well? Yes, all the hands are up. God says, do as, as I'm commanding you. Trust me, walk with me, get close to me. This is God's intention describe it, that all will be well. This has always been like this, and it will always be. So just get to know that uh, God wants your life to be all is well. But my people would not listen to me. And this is the message of Jeremiah to the people of God that God wants them to hear. From the day your ancestors left Egypt until now, I have continued to send my servants, the prophets, day in and day out. This is how God is persevering over generation. Isaiah, 60 years. Jeremiah, 40 years. Then between, more of them, minor prophets and between, before Isaiah. So all along, Elijah, Elisha, and then you go Samuel and the judges. You go through the history. God is so patient. He's so patient. I have continued to send my servants, the prophet, day in and day out. But again, my people have not listened to me or even tried to hear. So he's speaking to Jeremiah, tell them all this, but do not expect them to listen. Wow, that's so surprising. <laughs> speak, you are my prophet, speak to the people, but don't expect them to listen. Don't expect them to respond. This is, this is very, very shocking. Shout out your warnings, but do not expect them to respond. Say to them, this is the nation whose people will not obey the Lord their God and will refuse to be taught. So this is Jeremiah's message. This is Jeremiah's ministry to them. Pleaded for the people to return to God's way. And the story is, they refuse. They always refuse. They always refuse. They don't want to obey. They don't want to listen to God. And Jeremiah, you will see the heart of God through Jeremiah's message. You will see his, mess, his patience, his effort to reach out to them, his mercy, time and time again. He continued to send prophets day in and day out. And you will see a lot of arguments to confront the mentality, the viewpoints of the people, the reasoning of the people for not listening. God tells how he feels toward his people, his intention, but it came to a point. They refused to listen, that's what we're reading about, that God re re uh, stepped back from them, and that is what he says, he would withdraw his blessing. It, it, we read it in Jeremiah, for I have removed my protection and peace from them. I have taken away my unfailing love and mercy. What a tragedy for a life of people when it comes to that point. Because God had been like 60 years, 40 years, and more and more and more and more through the, through the past. So if God is not there to protect them and provide them protection, they will experience famine. Invaders would plunder them. They would finally be taken captive into uh, Babylon. So after that time, even Jeremiah prophesied to them that if you surrender to Babylon, 
then your life will be spared. But if you don't, then they will kill you, they will destroy the city, they will burn it all. But they again refuse to listen. And they consider the message of Jeremiah like unpatriotic, even like a treason. You are surrender. You are asking us to surrender to the, the king, enemy? Hey, what do you think uh, you, you're doing? We, we prefer to have some al alliances with uh, other, other countries to defend us. And the message was repeated to them. So because of that, he, was, he suffered rejection, uh, ridicule, uh, persecutions, and threats. And he, Jeremiah is often called man of sorrow, he, like Jesus. There's a lot of comparison between what Jeremiah has lived and experienced and the life of Jesus Christ, a man of sorrow. Jeremiah is often called a weeping prophet because he, sh he shed tears over the sin of his people and the judgment that was coming soon over them. So I want to go to the text where really we want to spend more time this morning, Jeremiah chapter 18. And uh, Jeremiah is asked to go down to the potter's, potter's home. Go down to the potter's shop and I will speak you there. So I did as he told me and found the potter working at his wheel. But the jar he was making did not turn out as he had hoped. So he crushed it into a lump and clay again and started over. Then the Lord gave me this message. O oh Israel, can I not do to you as this potter has done to his clay? As the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand. And this is where the message also is relevant to us again. This message applies to a country. It applies to individual, it applies to people in the Old Testament, it applies to people in the New Testament because it describes the unchanging God, the unchanging ways of the Lord. God is true to His holiness, to His justice, and to His love. And you see it throughout in every book of the Bible. Let, let's click the next verse because it gives us a, a background that is necessary for us. After this part in verse 12 says, but the people replied to God. God wants to give them another chance, but they replied to God. Don't waste your breath. Another Bible version you will see, it's useless. It's hopeless. Uh, we will continue to live as we want to, stubbornly following our own evil desire. This is a reflection of us today. God has the prophet to go to the past potter house and to observe, and he will learn a lesson. And we are learning this lesson. And God teaches us through this example, just as the potter in this story has the power to shape and form the clay as he desires, then we too are like the clay in God's hand. Unfortunately, for those of you who are parents and have young children, sometimes you, you are in a hurry and you want your child to follow you to go this direction. So what your child does, he wants to go to this direction. So he's, he's, he's fidgeting and he's not cooperating and he's pulling and he's trying to get out of, of, your, of your grip. And this is exactly the same thing that God's children are doing to their, to their potter and the master is potter's hands when he wants to mold us and shape us. Can you identify with that? Like, I'm not ready. It's hopeless. I'm not going to change. I love what I'm doing. Uh, and we, we, we push it later. I agreed. I'm not perfect. I need to change, but not right now. How many of you are like this? Is that only me? Yeah? Okay. So it's like, yes, but, yes, but, or yes, but not now. Uh, not let it, I, I like what I'm doing, so I'm not ready to change, and I refuse to change. And not only in, in these kind of things, but also in ha bad habits, uh, bad temperament, uh, with our speech, um, uh, with our anger, refusing to forgive, uh, relationship. How many of you, you have this experience? If you are married, I'm sorry, I'm always talking to you, those who are married. <laughs> maybe, maybe it's... Uh, that you have experienced sometimes the, the non-speaking for two or three days. The non-speaking uh, treatment, like, uh, okay. Avoiding to speak unless it is absolutely necessary. So this is what 
you know, we see it in spiritual life in the same way. I just refuse. I'm not ready. They leave me alone. I, I, I'm like this and I will stay like that. How many of us are you? You are excusing yourself for not just, just being you. This is how I am. Oh, this is not what God wants, you know, this is not what God wants. So the, the, the master potter wants to shape us. He's trying to mold these areas of my life or your life, this part of you that is saying it's hopeless. Don't change that. I'm okay like this for now. I'm waiting until later. And I have an observation that uh, and it's, it's difficult for me to even speak about that because I, I, I'm uncomfortable, but I wonder why many Christians do not change. Why many Christians are still holding on to their bad habits. Like I've been in Lighthouse for 24 years, and I still see people 10 years, 15 years past, they're still going back to case one. They're still being hurt by the same thing. They are still angry people. They are still unforgiving people. They are still bad-mouthing people. They still have these things. And this is like, it seems that it is disappearing for a while, but then it's coming back again and again, maybe a year later, two years later, and it seems that there are things that are not changing. When we are called to be, by the potter's hand, transformed into the likeness of God, the righteousness and holiness, to the likeness of Him who created us, it says in Ephesians and Colossians. And we are still not doing that. We are still in our flesh, very, very comfortable in our flesh. Very justifying our flesh also. And trying to get our friends to approve our flesh. How many of you have this problem? Or am I the only one? <laughs> I'm the only one. Okay. With God, can something bad in my life be hopeless, unchangeable, impossible to be transformed? I remember when I was a bit younger, married, and sometimes it was for fun. Sometimes we joke with our imperfection, isn't it? Just to make it a bit less. And uh, my wife would gently because she's very gentle and uh, she's not a nagging wife never been she would point out something that i should improve in my life and i would jokingly justify myself and saying oh this is how my grandfather used to be this is how my father used to be so that's why and then with the wisdom of a godly woman she would say but you are not supposed to resemble your grandfather you're supposed to resemble jesus ah what can i say to that yeah I have. she's forcing me to she's forcing me to change with god everything is possible and it must change. This change that, you know, is not going away can be changed. Is that true? Yes. yes. All right. Well, we're making progress. Okay. <laughs> God calls upon Israel to come into conformity to his work of his hands. If they don't, they will become damaged. And this is something very important. I have a lot of truth this morning, so pay attention. When you refuse to change something that the potter is working on, you put it until later, you become damaged good. If this pot here, the, 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 the potter is fixing a nice, nice pot, this is not in clay, but let's say it is in clay, and he's shaping it to all flowers, then you put water in and it's leaking like a broken cistern. What are you going to do with that? It's damaged. Can you use it for the beautiful uh, flowers and lighthouse on Sunday morning? No, you cannot. So what do you do with that? You have to put it outside for another use. Put it outside, out of the door, on the balcony, and put your trash in instead. Instead of having the flower to honor God on Sunday morning, it will be receiving trash outside. It's still being used. So which one would you like to be used for? To be beautiful, to be for the honor of God? Or you want to be outside receiving the trash? 
It's easy, easy answer, isn't it? So, but many times we don't realize that the transformation that the potter wants to do in our life has the same result. If we don't let the potter change us and build us into perfection, we become damaged good. And do you know what happens when we become damaged good? We become also blind. And we are blind of that conditions. We don't even realize that. We just just like the way I am and people are used to see me like this and we don't know that we have missed that what God wanted to do in our life that sanctifying process in our life so don't become damaged good okay another truth about this God is building is shaping molding and then it says in the text there's a damage path okay let's do it again did you notice that God is not throwing away the clay? He is not discarding it. He is not throwing it in the garbage. He is keeping it and he is remolding it. But he needs to first smash it first and then he will rebuild. How encouraging it is for us that years after years we disobey. We are rebellious. We don't listen. We have ignored the transformation the Holy Spirit wanted to do with us. And every time God has to start again. Because He loves you and He loves me. And He wants you in heaven. And He wants to use you. He has a purpose and He has a plan for you. And it is clear in the book of Jeremiah that He has one. That is the big picture that what He wants to do. And then we refuse. We don't cooperate. So then they, we become imperfection. So it's either we accept the, the, the fingers and the molding and the tools f for the shape that God has intended or path, let's do it again. But the good thing is that God doesn't throw us outside finish. He's going to try again. He's going to try again. He's going to try again. But in our rebellion, we are missing years. We are missing the time. We are missing the plan. We are missing the usefulness, the fruitfulness. Because every time that we resist or we re rebel, he has to smash, like it's a punishment, it's, a, it's something that we are missing on the blessing of God, and now it's difficult, and it's, we're not content, we're not achieving what God wants for our life, and then we start all over again. And this is very, very much the lesson of Jeremiah. God does not destroy. Actually, uh, according to Isaiah, Jeremiah, or uh, Paul, even in the New Testament, there is no such a potter who will create, start creating with the purpose of throwing away. That, that is, just doesn't make sense. Ha, who would start something with the purpose, when I finish, I break it. It's, that doesn't make the The one who starts to, to do pottery has, the, has, has a plan in his mind. He has a goal in his mind. He wants to achieve something. So if it doesn't work, he's not throwing it away. There is no such a potter. It does not exist. So <clears throat> never think that God is such an angry God. Because sometimes the God of the Old Testament, we think that he's such an angry God. Okay? But God has a plan. Look at the, the, the people of, of Israel. We look at them. Now he's withdrawing his blessing after how many years? After trying for so, uh, how long has it been? So now he is going to smash it. Babylon is coming. They are going to go there. But God is so good. He's not throwing it away. He says, 70 years. Even during these 70 years, I will bless you and the land where you will be. I will keep you and I will bring you back. And when I will bring you back, I know the plans that I have made for you. They are plans not to harm you. I want to give you something good, a future. So this God that smashed Israel into captivity is going to be with them during their captivity. Is going to bring them back after the captivity because in the big picture, he has a plan. He has a plan for the future. Same with you, same with me. Even though sometimes God is doing a work that is hurtful, He is with you during this hard time, and He's going to bring you back, and He has a plan for your life. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. God is the wise potter who works the clay to form useful honor tools. 
This is another truth that is very important. The vessels of dishonors are not vessels which are destroyed, but vessels that are going to be used for ordinary, casual use. Thinking of my toilet bowl at home. If you come home, I have a toilet bowl at home, and it's very useful. If you want to wash your hands, you will see me, I wash your hands, and I will show you where the door is, and you will go there. But I would never serve you borscht soup in the toilet bowl. <laughs> it is for another use. When people come to our home, my wife is very gentle, and she's very hospitable, so, so if you come to our home, she, she will pull out from our uh, closet, ca cabinet the nicest dish, not the dish that we use every day. I think the dish we use every day is okay. It's okay for me, it's okay for all of us. But if you come to our home, she will put a ta tablecloth. I don't have a tablecloth when uh, you don't come to my home. I just have like, an, uh, you know, like a table something. But then she will put that. And then she will take like this nice crystal salad ball and the wooden spoons. That's for you because she wants to honor you. So, but, you see, this is what she wants to display to you because you're the guest and she wants to honor. So she thinks, she takes the utensils of honor that were hidden in the cabinet, she pulls them out so that you can see it, eat in it, and be honored by that. Then suddenly you say, may I wash my hands? And I will say, yes, the door is over there. Then you will use another tool in our home that is not as graceful but is very useful and you will appreciate using it if you need it. But this is the difference that happens when the, the master is working in your life. He wants to make you these crystal balls. He wants to make you this honorable use that will fit for his use. But I refuse. I don't cooperate. So there's imperfection. The water will not be retained. So I will end up on the balcony outside. Or I can, by my unwillingness to be changed, become the toilet bowl. Or I can become the crystal salad bowl. I have a choice between the two. And God will, will continue to work. If you are a toilet bowl, you are still useful. But maybe that's not what you want to become. Maybe you want to become something that the master will show to the guests and will be honored, something that will be useful. You see, read that in the New Testament. You read that everywhere. So that is the difference. You choose what you want to be. If you go back to the book of Genesis, you will see this, the story starts there. God creates man from the dust, from the clay, and he shapes them. The man and the woman, and they are going to have a garden, they are going to have plentiful, they are going to have God's blessing and God's presence. Chapter 3, what happened? The first rebellion, the first disobedience, the first time that the child says, he wants to go away, the going away from the child, from the creator and the potter. It's a tragedy. And then what does God do? And his love, he doesn't let go. He did not destroy, he just wants to remake, he just wants to reshape this one, so he start a plan. But God can only do that with your cooperation. It takes your will under his will to submit, to surrender, to say, yes, I trust you, I will hear, I will listen, please restore unto me the joy of salvation, create in me. Uh, the steadfast heart, a heart that is uh, pleasing to the Lord. Uh, we have a, a, a quote here, I think, if you go to the next slide, uh, if you go to click one time. Like the clay, we can be moldable or we can become hard. The choice is ours. We can do that. There's also another quote, I think it comes somewhere in the, uh, the, the shape uh, and somewhere else. God allows you men to determine what kind of vessel they will be. H. H. Rowley has written that. So you have a part in what God wants to do. And if you look at the uh, Roman, the text that we have that, 
We okay. No, let's go back to the Jeremiah 18. Jeremiah 18. Jeremiah went to the potter's house and he finds three things that he observed there. And this is a fantastic lesson for all of us. First thing that he finds is the clay. And as he watched the potter work with the clay, he realized he's looking at the picture of himself. He's looking at the picture of you. He's looking at the picture of every nation. This is the clay. We are the clay. God said it. We just read it in, in Isaiah. You are my father. You are the potter. We are the clay. We are the work of, of your hands. That is what we have led. So like the clay, we can be moldable or we can become hard. The choice is yours. The second thing that Jeremiah observes is the will. The will of the potter, that's very important because that's how, just by a gentle pressure of either a tool or his hands, the shape becomes for all the artists that are here and, and the room. This is a picture. The will stands for the circumstances of our life. Good and bad circumstances, emotions, emotionally draining, uh, what put you down or, or some choices, tough decisions and things. But the, all of these circumstances are under the control of the potter. That's the will, the will of circumstances. We are many times taken by surprise. A child is born in the family, we lose a job. Uh, uh, th things happen and we make decisions and choices that are good or that are bad. Choices that will come against us. We make a compromise. We choose sin because we have a benefit, immediate benefit, instead of thinking of the bad consequences that is coming along. So we make choices. This is the wheels of circumstances. We have temptations. Uh, we have desires. Uh, we have people in our lives. And these, this is the wheels of our uh, circumstances. And the lesson is, is very clear. All of our life is being shaped and molded by the potter. And through the circumstances of life, we call it the wheels of circumstance. It brings us again and again under the potter's hand. Every time you f meet a crisis, a decision, you are in a situation, it's like you are on the wheel. And the potter is constantly at work because he never stopped working. This is, this is who he is. He's the potter, we are the clay. We, this is our life. The clay is our life. The circumstances of our life. It's either we are molded or we are smashed and start all over again. And this is what the lesson is and the, the wheels. The wheels under the pressure of the molding fingers of the potter, he shapes the vessel according to his will. According to his good pleasure, Philippians chapter 2, verse 13 says us that. Third, Jeremiah saw the potter. He sees the clay, he sees the wheels, the circumstances of life, then he sees the potter that is God, the great potter. Why are we there? <laughs> Let's go back to where we were. God is the great potter. He has ownership and authority. He's the potter. He has ownership of the clay. Who does the clay belong to? The clay belongs to the potter. If it is his, he has the authority. He has the ownership. And sometimes we forget that. We think our life is ours. Our possessions are ours. What we do with our time is ours. We are free. We, we cry out for freedom. It's, it has become a very strong word. And many people, we think that freedom it's like the ch we don't realize it, but it's like the child who wants to break from the hands, the, the, secure, the secure hands, the, the, the safe hands, and the safe leading of the parents, the parents that knows where he's going and what is going to protect this child from crossing the street. But the child just wants out. He wants freedom because he thinks that the child is freedom. He's, he's, he has everything. You know, and this is what we are with, with the, the, the potter. This is what we are in our, in our life. We think that breaking from God, we will be free. That's the, the first lie that Satan brought to Adam and Eve. You know, so, so this is a repetition. This is, we, we continue. And here, the great potter has ownership and authority. He wants, he knows what he is going to do. And let's go to Romans chapter 9. Verse 20 and 21. This is Paul's argument. Will that is what is molded see to its molder? Why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay 
to make out the same lump, one vessel for honorable use and another one for dishonorable use. So here, the potter has the same clay, and uh, if the same clay is submitting to his design, it will become a very nice vase that will be useful, usable, and honorable. But if, if it resists and it will be imperfection, then you give God no other choice but to start all over again. And this is what we read. It. The, 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 of course, the potter has authority. Of course, he has the right to do what, what, he, what he wants with the, with the clay. The vessel is shaped according to the potter's mind. The potter has, a, has, a, has an idea of what he is trying to achieve with, the, with, this, with this vase. This potter is holy. This potter is just. And this potter is love. And these three qualities always bring them together because otherwise you will get out of, of, of balance. The, this potter has the idea of a beautiful masterpiece that he wants to, to do. And this potter has the skill and he is able to do it. The design is going to do it. If there is imperfection in the clay and his design, and it spoils his work, the potter smash it. He has no choice because he will continue to reshape it. He is always doing that. What, what would you like best? That is continually reshaping you with the hope that you will finally reach out your potential or you prefer that it throws you away in hell. You have a choice. Me, I prefer to be smashed and to be reshaped. Do you? Yes? Okay, so we understand. So, then he will take the lump and begin again to make it into a vessel according to his own mind. God allows humans to determine what kind of vessel they, want, they will be. And this is the quotes that we have here. Now let's go to the next one, Jeremiah 18.6. And he's like a, some kind of a conclusion and a, and a lesson from the visit of Jeremiah at the potter's, potter's shop. O oh Israel, can I not do to you as a potter has done to his clay? As the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand. And here is an application to a nation, but it is an application to individual as well. If I announce to a certain nation or kingdom, it's going to be uprooted, torn or destroyed, like there's a judgment coming. But then the nation renounces its evil ways. It surrendered to God. It listens to God. It pay attention. So what does God will do? I will not destroy it as it had planned. Depending on your Bible version, you will see what, what's happening here. And the opposite is true. If God had promised to bless this land, this nation, and they go into sinfulness and disobedience and refuse to walk with God, then God changing his mind and then he has to smash the clay. That's what God is doing. We have a lesson here. When the pressure that the potter applies is successful into your life or into a nation to go in the right directions, become what God is trying to do, the potter seems to change his mind and the word you sometimes in your Bible may be repent or relent or change his mind. But actually it's a very interesting words for repent in the Old Testament talking about God. It's the word <sighs> sigh. Breathe heavily. Oh no. Oh la 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 la. That's what God is doing. Oh la 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 la. When will they understand? Why not? What are they doing? Why don't they get it that I love him and I want to? So it's like this, this, this disappointment that God has. Because God had declared something, but the clay respond. The clay submit. So God says, I'm changing. I had promised that I was going to punish you, but I'm changing my mind. I'm not going to punish you. And the other one is true also. If everything was going good, this building, this beautiful, it's almost finished. And then at the end, I don't know if you have ever done that. 
you f almost finish and then oh no i was almost finish and then you have to smash and start all over again. But you were almost there. So that's what you read here. This nation, God had promised a blessing. It was coming to the left and to the right. And then they turned to their evil ways. Ah, God is breathing. And then he's changing it. And he has to do it again. This is our life, brothers and sisters. This is, this is what we are doing. This is the same lessons that we have to, to learn in, in our individual life. Is some hard circumstances come to our life. It may be temptations, decisions that you have to make, and it, you, you might be facing dif different things. Uh, then this is the will, the will of God. The potter will apply this pressure uh, to, to, mold, to mold us. If you follow his direction, what will happen? He will, the pressure will be relieved, the vessel will take shape. But if there is rebellion, then you, you go back to imperfection and it will be crushed. And this is the, the, the lessons. And we are, we are finishing with the next uh, slide. We, we know this text in the New Testament and it makes a connection with the Old Testament. Now in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some honorable use and some dishonorable. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, like his butter, his maker, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. This is the goal of your life. This is what God is doing, but he needs your cooperation, your obedience, your faith, your trust. And to, to conclude this, the hands of the potter over your life, you need to trust these hands. Why? Because the hands of the, the potter that is going, that is actually right now shaping your life are the hands that bled on the cross and were nailed on the cross for you. This is his hand that are now working on your life to try to achieve something that is usable, something that is meeting his, his, his use, something that you can fit for the master's use. And this is his blood, this is his hand that is shaping you. And it is a beautiful lesson. You know, in this church we have a lot of progress to make. As I said before, I wonder why many of us were not changing. And many times we are regressing. And it's not the oldest Christians that are the best Christians, necessarily, or vice versa. It is the willing Christians that are becoming what God is doing in their heart. But there is a lot of uh, resistance and especially in the areas of the tongue. The tongue is many times used for dishonorable use, unfortunately. And it hurts, and it's damaging, and some people are ye for years and years are angry at other people. Some people will never sit there. They will always sit there to make the most distance of the church. If this church would be bigger, they would be much <laughs> further to sit there. There are people who are angry, people who have been hurt 15 years ago and they are still hurt, they are still angry, they are still not. There are still a lot of problems in many of our lives. Many of us come from other churches and we come from a past. And when you have come to, to join Lighthouse, maybe in this year or in the last few years, you have come with your baggage of trouble. And, and you are dealing with this, it's heavy on you, and you, you don't know, but this is who, who you are. And the master has to smash if you are not going to cooperate to let go. So young, young Christians, do not look at the old Christians. If you are hurt sometimes by their example, just let it go. Uh, just let it go. Just let the, the master shape you. Don't 
Don't go in this direction. Don't let anybody affect you that is not leading you to become the, the, the vessel that is fit for the master's use. That's the only thing that, that should concern you. Are you a vessel of honor? Have you become that? Are you becoming this? Are you on the way? Are you cooperating with God? That's the only thing that concerns the Lord for you. And His hands are continually trying to change these areas of imperfections and to mold you into becoming you yourself, not because of others, not because of your age and the church, not because you know anything, not because you are working at the sound or singing. It's nothing to do. It's you. He is working, he is shaping you. And you decide. The shaping process is hard and long. Trials come to shape us. Our faith is stretched and tested, but in all the stretching and shaping is one design is to make us a vessel he can use for his glory. That's the only thing that is important. You and him. You are the clay. You are the work of his hand. For we are God's masterpiece. In process. In progress. We are on the wheel. The wheel of circumstance of our life. And if we let his gentle pressure, his good pressure, his intention for us grow, we will be beautiful. Everybody will see how beautiful Jesus is in your life. If not, they will not see it. You will be outside receiving the trash. You choose. We cooperate. We let Him change us. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Let God shape you to become what He created you to be. You see all the little fancy things that He is doing? He can make it. He can make you so beautiful. That's his intention. Would you stand this morning in the... Hallelujah. We, we sang this song at the end of the first service. I would like to go to that song that really changed my heart, oh God. We will not sing a long time. It's already